Well, good morning. Welcome to worship. Uh, happy Mother's Day to uh, all of you that are here today. Uh, whether you're a mother or not, you can have a happy day. But especially to those uh, mothers that are here today, uh, we appreciate you and are glad that you're here. Those of you watching online, uh, likewise, we are glad that you're joining us today and hope that this is a, a blessed and happy day for you as well. Uh, I, I do know that for many, Mother's Day is a great celebration. For others, it can bring up some issues of, of things that weren't quite what we'd hoped they would be. But uh, whether it is a celebration or it, whatever it may be for you today, I pray that you encounter Jesus today and that he works to help you celebrate. He works to help you in any way that you need this Mother's Day. Uh, a couple of announcements for us this morning. Um, we have some gifts for the mothers or any women basically that are here today. Uh, there is some brand new 2020 um, mind, I guess, uh, maple, 2022 maple syrup. That's right. 2022 maple syrup that uh, was produced this year by a couple of our guys in our church. And so after the service, you can collect one of these uh, things. They even have a nice little uh, Happy Mother's Day label on the front. So it's good stuff. It's sweet. Also, we have in the uh, foyer and after the service some baby bottles. And you might think, well, I don't need a baby bottle. Well, you may want to take this one with you today. It's got a little slot in it right here. Uh, and that is designed not to let milk uh, fall out, but for coins to go in. We are partnering with the Crisis, Crisis, Pregnancy, Crisis Pregnancy Center of Pine City this uh, month to uh, help raise support for their ministry, for women that are, are struggling in a pre pregnancy that has crisis tied to it. And so there is a baby bottle fundraising challenge that is encouraging you to take this today, Return it on Father's Day and put change. Put your spare change into it all the time. And if it gets full, take that change out and, and replace it with uh, dollar bills or whatever to uh, make that work, and uh, we'll do that. For those of you watching online, we're going to set up a, a, a giving spot on our website. So if you go to our giving space, that for this month will be for the Crisis Pregnancy Center. And so you can take part as well. So we are glad that you are here today worshiping with us, and I've got both of my hands full. Not usually used to doing that, but um, glad that you're here. Let's pray. Father, I do lift up uh, the women in our service today, whether in person or online. We pray that as they are, are looking to this day, that it would be a day of, of joy, of reflection, uh, for the mothers that are here, we pray that it would be a time to just uh, uh, allow, allow the relationships that they have poured their lives into the, to just reflect back to them the joy. Father, for those who are suffering because a mother has, has been lost, perhaps recently, uh, there may be a lot of grief tied into this day, but there's also something deeper, the impact that that mother has had. And so whether that is a fresh uh, a loss, or one that may be decades old. We pray that you would help us to, to celebrate the mothers that we've had that have passed. Father, too, we pray for those whose uh, situation with their own mother was tough. We just pray that, that you would lead us to a place of healing, lead those who struggle in, in that relationship to a place of wholeness that can come, that can only come through relationship with you, through Jesus Christ. So we lift up this time of worship and celebration to you. We do all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we have our Bible reading this morning. It is, let me pull it up here. There we go. It is from Isaiah chapter 52. It says, oh, I got myself out of order here. Isaiah 52. I got myself really out of order. Sorry. All right, we are going to go way back up here. I'm, I hit the reverse. All right. Therefore, my people will know my name. Therefore, in that day, therefore, all right, we're going to start over. I got it. Now, let's back it up. Can you back it up? There we go. We're good. Let's take a breath. We're going to be okay. This reminds me of a T-shirt. We were. We, this is a little aside. We were uh, down in uh, 
Gulf Shores with our kids, and we, on our way back, we stopped, and uh, we were looking at a um, Cracker Barrel and looking through this stuff. Saw a T-shirt there my daughter bought for me, and it's got skipper-type stuff on it. it says, but it said, but did we sink? So did we sink? We're okay. We're okay. I love that T-shirt. Did we sink? We're all right. All right. Therefore, my people will know my name. Therefore, in that day, they will know that it is I who foretold it. How beautiful on the mountain are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Amen. Well, I'm glad he got all the glitches out of the way, <laughs> yeah, exactly. so we're going to be smooth That's sailing right. here now. <laughs> smooth sailing. That was, oper that was operator error. <laughs> <laughs> all right, would you stand as we join together as we worship the Lord? the Lord of my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your
worship His holy name. Sing like never before. This next one is a newer song, but just kind of join right in as you're able. We've done this once before. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray, unveil what we were made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church. We need your power. Seek your kingdom first, we hunger and we thirst, refuse to waste our lives for your joy and prize. To see the captive hearts released, the hurt, the sick, the poor at peace, we lay down our lives for heaven's cause. Reaching the near and far, no force of hell can stop your beauty changing hearts. You made us for much more than this. Awake the kingdom seed in us, fill us with the strength and love of Christ. We are your church. seat.
get to the message. Yeah, you, you don't want that, do you? you got, there we go. All right. We don't want that. This past week, I was talking to the mother that I know best, and that's my wife, Cindy. And I, I don't remember how we got on this conversation, but we were talking about brand loyalty, about different brands that uh, uh, we may be very loyal to. And she said, you know, I really don't have very many, but I have one. And she said, it's Dawn Soap, Dawn Dishwashing Liquid. And I smiled inside because I knew that I was going to be talking about Dawn Dishwashing Liquid this morning. (laughs) And uh, Dawn is amazing. Uh, I came across a... um, article years ago that talked about some of the ways that Dawn is used. And uh, let me see if I can give you. It can be used to repel ants, unclog toilets. It can be used uh, with poison ivy. It can be used to control aphids in the garden, uh, keep them off your fruit trees. It can be a phenomenal eyeglass cleaner. And that's just a few things. But what's interesting to me is I had a conversation with my friend, Jeff, who is a medical examiner. And he told me about how he used Dawn soap in his profession. I'm not going to go into the details of how he used it or where he did that, because that's all you would think about the rest of this service. But if you want to know more, you would would know the details of this story. You can ask me later. But he talked about how he used it to clean some things up that I would have never thought you could use Dawn soap for that. Did you know that there is a kind of Dawn soap that works wonders? It works wonders in bringing light into this world. And you know what it is? It's you. It is followers of Jesus Christ. At least it can be followers of Jesus Christ. We're in the third message of our Lighted Up series, which is about lighting up this world with the message of Jesus Christ, inviting people to follow and to know Jesus. Uh, Today, we're going to be talking about the wonderful, incredible, Dawn Soap-like, amazingly effective power of shining your natural light. Your natural light can have an incredible power in this world. We're going to start with a picture, uh, an illustration, a story. Ken Davis, who is a youth speaker and communicator and comedian, uh, he, he shared a story in his book, How to Speak to Youth, about an experiment that he conducted with uh, about 100 people who had graduated from a college, and they were moving into youth ministry. And so he had them all in an auditorium, and he ran an experiment with them. He, he pulled one person out. We'll call him Joe. Pulled Joe out, sent him out of the room, and there he was blindfolded, and Joe was told that when he goes back in, he could do anything he wants. And then there was the class that was given the instruction to say, get Joe to do something. And then, unknown to everybody else, Joe and to the rest of the class, they talked to Sarah in private. And her instruction was this, get Joe to climb the stairs to the back of the auditorium by the door and have him walk up to the professor and give the professor a hug. And so they brought Joe in. There was one stipulation. They could do whatever they want, talk, scream, yell, but they couldn't move. Everybody had to stay in their seats. And so they began the experiment. Joe came in. He was blindfolded. And the room erupted in shouts, shouting. And Sarah, who'd been given that instruction, was told, this is a life and death matter. You have to get Joe to get to see his professor and to give the professor a hug. It's a matter of life and death. And so the class are yelling whatever instructions they want Joe to do. Sarah is trying to get Joe to go there and is pleading with him. But Joe wandered around, he was disoriented, he was confused, and he ended up being paralyzed because in the noise of a hundred people screaming at him, he couldn't make out one message to follow. That's 
kind of what it's like for people in our world today. It's kind of what it's like for youth in our day when, when we've got a world yelling at us, screaming at us, telling us what to do and how to live. And, and, and we may be, in a sense, shouting the good news of Jesus, but it gets drowned out gets drowned out in all of the commotion and all of the other shouting that takes place in this world. And so they went to the second round, the second part of the experiment, brought Joe back out and blindfolded him, kept him blindfolded, I guess, let him out, got him out there. And they told the class, you get to do the same things. But this time they added another element. They recruited Tammy. And Tammy's instructions were, whatever you have to do, don't let Joe follow Sarah's instructions. And they allowed Tammy and Sarah to get up and move, but they couldn't touch Joe. They brought Joe back in, and, and all of a sudden the room erupted in, in noise again and shouts, but Tammy and Sarah both came, and they, and they began to speak to Joe, one on each side. And in a sense, they had to shout to, at Joe for him to be able to hear, and he could hear their messages. And so he would follow one for a little bit, and then he'd turn and he'd follow the other one, and then he'd turn and follow the other one again and again. He never fully committed to either one of them. You know, people cannot hear the good news about Jesus unless we get close to them. Other messages are going to compete and in this situation, at least the message was heard. The message to go climb the steps and embrace the instructor was heard. But there was this competition and this confusion that Joe experienced. And so they did the experiment one more time. Same as the second time, except for one change. Sarah could touch Joe. She couldn't drag him. She couldn't force him. But she could touch, touch Joe. They brought Joe back in. It exploded in noise again. And Tammy and Sarah were there, but then Sarah put her hand on his shoulder, another on his arm, and began to say, Joe, this is where you need to go. And he began to follow. He began to follow, Tam, uh, follow his, uh, Sarah's instructions and made his way up the stairs. But as he did, Tammy went, no, nah, she's screaming, screaming at him. And then, and then something, in fact, really dangerous, if we understand it. Not dangerous in that sense, but dangerous to the cause of bringing the message of Jesus forward. As soon as Joe began to make his way towards the instructor, the class gave up their individual messages, whatever they were, and they started to join Tammy. And they started to shout, don't go, don't do it. And more and more they began to shout that. And in fact, it became like a stadium chant. It was, don't go, don't go. It got louder and louder and unified to try and keep Joe from doing it. Joe finally followed Sarah, his, her guidance. She didn't drag him, but made her way up his, made his way up into the, uh, in front of the professor, stood there, and, and it was loud, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And he hesitated. Then he finally threw his arms around the professor. And the room exploded with joy. It, it, they, were, they knew what it was about. They knew it was about getting someone to choose to embrace Jesus. And so they understood that, and they, they exploded with joy. Isn't that how the world works, though? If, if there are a competing message for people's attention, uh, they will fight for each other. But if somebody becomes, becomes interested in Jesus, it's amazing how all of a sudden those competing voices begin to unify against somebody following Jesus. You know... If the good news of Jesus is to be heard, this is very important. If the good news of Jesus is to be heard and accepted, we can't just shout it. We can't just shout it inside church buildings. 
We certainly can't just shout it on Facebook as if shouting the message of Jesus somehow is going to work. We can't get a bullhorn, whatever kind of bullhorn we would grab, and, and just shout the message of Jesus because there's so many others that are shouting and their bullhorns are louder, more consistent, and seem to be endlessly, uh, endlessly keep from getting tired. See, the detergent of yelling, of shouting, it doesn't clean very well. If the good news of Jesus is going to be heard, we must go out and draw close to people. And if we really want the good news of Jesus to go out to lead people to an embrace with Jesus, we must reach out in love and gently guide people to Jesus. Joe is asked afterwards, as they kind of evaluated what took place, he said, they said, why did you follow Sarah? He said, because it felt like she was the only one who cared about me. That touch communicated care. When people understand that the message of Jesus is wrapped up in our care for them, they're more likely to listen. Your dawn soap-like Jesus sharing power is sharing your natural light in up-close and personal ways so that people are led to an embrace with Jesus. Now, when I say your natural light, I'm talking about the light that becomes ours when we place faith in Jesus Christ because Jesus said, you are the light of the world. When we become followers of Jesus Christ, we are transformed from darkness into light. It talks about that in Ephesians 5. You were once darkness. Now you are light in the Lord. And as followers of Jesus Christ, our natural light is Jesus' light in us. And when we share our natural light in ways that lead people to embrace Jesus, that ignites incredible joy in us, in the person who embraces Jesus. Even the angels in heaven sing and celebrate when that happens. And you know what? That's our Jesus follower mission. That's what Jesus follows us to do. So I've got a question for us. If there's so much joy in that and there's so much that can come from that, and if that's our mission, that's what God's called us to do. Why do many Jesus followers struggle to share the good news about Jesus? You know, it's said that Christians and non-Christians share something in common when it comes to evangelism. It makes them both nervous. And they both struggle with it. Evangelizing and being evangelized. And there's some reasons for that. Many people think that sharing Jesus means you have to shine unnatural light, at least unnatural for you, to be able to share the message of Jesus. How we see talking about Jesus, how we envision it in our minds, can block us from sharing Jesus with others. Did you know that? How we envision, how we think about talking about Jesus can block us from sharing Jesus with others. There's some perspectives you might call positive that people have that can really kind of be a block for them. Some people think that, well, you know, really, the only people really good at sharing Jesus are the extroverted people, the people people, those who are really committed, those who are very articulate those who are extremely bold, those who are very outgoing, those who are courageous, those who are very articulate, uh, those who are Bible experts, Billy Grahams, those are the people God has to share the message of Jesus Christ. But, they think, that's just not me. And it feels even unnatural to try. But there's also a negative view of sharing Jesus that can block us from sharing Jesus. 
Because many people see Christians who share their faith, uh, evangelists who share their faith as being pushy, being obnoxious, insensitive, sometimes money-grabbing, self-centered, and sometimes with a bad haircut. (laughs) That doesn't happen in my world for me, but that's not one of my concerns, but a, a bad haircut. I hope that feels unnatural to you, being pushy, being obnoxious. I hope that feels unnatural to you. You don't have to be that to share Jesus. But many people think that you have to be something like that, and that's just not going to be me. Either I, I become some, someone really great and then fail at it, or I become something goofy or odd. <laughs> that's just not going to happen. But I got really good news for you. There's a better option. And this is it. Be yourself in Jesus. Be yourself in Jesus. Be yourself in ways people need and in ways people can understand. So our challenge here is, or inviting you, is to shine your natural Jesus light to build relationships, relationship bridges that help people find and embrace Jesus. That's why we're here, to help people find and embrace Jesus. How do you do that? I'm so glad you asked. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning at verse 19, says this. Apostle Paul is talking to the Corinthians. He says, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I may win some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. How do we help people embrace Jesus? How do we help people find and embrace him? First thing Paul tells us is that we need to build relational bridges to where people live. Build relational bridges to where people live. It's amazing how people will talk, Christians will talk about, well, yes, we're a welcoming church. We, you know, anybody that comes, they can come. But the bridge is somebody else has to become like us to hear the message of Jesus. I'm so glad that Jesus became like us so we could hear and learn the message of Jesus. Paul said to the Jews, he became like a Jew, to law keepers like a law keeper, to the lawless. He became like the lawless, to the weak like the weak. To us, to neighbors, be like neighbors, the neighbors. To coworkers and family, be like the coworkers and family. Find out the interests, find out the, the way of relating, find out how to build a bridge of relationship there. To the weak, become like the weak. You see, a relational bridge is natural. It builds connection. Just as Sarah put her hand on Joe's shoulder, made a connection for someone who couldn't see, and it brought a sense of comfort and connection in a world filled with noise. But see, we've got to do more than that. To make those connections, relationship bridges must, must be anchored in Jesus Christ. They must be anchored in Jesus Christ. And that's why the Apostle Paul said he became like a Jew, though he was not under the law. He didn't accept everything that the Jewish people were engaging with because he understood that in Christ there is something new. But I could still engage with them. And he said he became like one not having the law. But that didn't mean that he threw out and joined in every aspect of sin, in any aspect of sin. He didn't do that. But he became like them relationally. He got into their world and into their lives. But he said, 
I'm not free to do whatever because I am a servant of Jesus Christ. When I was in seminary, I had a class about sharing the gospel. And the professor, it's interesting how certain things you remember. This one locked in for me. He said there are three types of Christians in the world. He said type one Christians would never be contaminated by anything or anyone that they would call unrighteous. They would never expose themselves to anybody who they would think could pollute them in some way. And so type one Christians are, are, are going to find themselves in holy huddles, talking about how bad the world is and how good they are becoming. They might be very good at shouting the message of Jesus, but they're probably even better at judging other people. They are terrible at leading people to an embrace with Jesus Christ. Why? Because they cannot get close enough to people who need to hear about Jesus. They've been cut off from making that connection. Then he talked about type 3 Christians. We'll get to type 2. Type 3 Christians, he said, uh, are so immersed in the ways of the world that, that their belief in Jesus isn't, an, isn't visible at all to somebody in the world. Uh, they become so much like the way people live in the world, their actions, their behaviors, what they do, what they say, that somebody who knows them and knows them for years would have no idea that that's a follower of Jesus Christ. That's, he's just like me. She's just like me. And they're terrible at leading people to Jesus because there's nothing distinctive in their life. There's nothing attractive in their life. There's no difference that's been made because of Jesus in them. They show no positive distinctive, distinctiveness in their lives because of Jesus. Then there are type 2 Christians. They're the best type to build a relational bridge that leads people into a, an embrace with Jesus. Why? Because they go where people are who need to hear about Jesus, and there they demonstrate the beauty and the joy of relationship with Jesus. They go into the place where people who need to hear Jesus are, and they rub shoulders with them, they engage with them, they care about them, they interact with them, but they are distinctive in that their life is grounded and centered in Jesus, and people begin to recognize it. And they can hear the words. The people that need to hear Jesus can hear the words, but they also begin to see and feel the life of Jesus coming through and touching their life, making an impact. You see, in other words, type 2 Christians use their dawn soap-like Jesus sharing power to shine their natural Jesus light into the darkness. And they do it in up-close and personal ways. You know, in the times of Jesus, there were all these laws about, you, you know, you got to stay away from this unclean, this unclean, that uh, unrighteous person, this or that. Jesus was a friend of sinners. There's this fear that if I get close to somebody, they're going to contaminate me. Jesus understood they didn't have the power to contaminate him. But he had the power when he got close to somebody to take whatever was contaminated in their life, whatever healing and forgiveness they needed, when he got close to people, he knew he could bring that into their lives. He didn't join them in what was wrong. He invited them into the life that he offered. And when we are the light of the world, just like Jesus, we get close to people. Careful not to join in what we shouldn't, but we get close to people, understanding that the life of Jesus in us can bring healing and forgiveness as we draw people to Jesus and they embrace Jesus. That's our role. That's our job, is leading people to an embrace with Jesus. And you know what? You can do that. And you can do that. And you can do that. And you can do that. You can do it. See, the light of Jesus is in you can lead people to find and embrace Jesus. How? Well, we build natural relationships to where people are. We do so in such a way that they're anchored 
in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And third, and third, this is important. We bring the good news of Jesus across the bridge to the people that need to hear. We got to do more than just be with people. We need to share what Jesus has done in our lives. We let that light shine, not just in how we live and the joy we have, but in our words. Why build bridges to people? Why anchor and protect your, yourself as you do so? To win as many people to Jesus as you can. Jews, law keepers, lawbreakers, th- those in need, so that as many people can be reached. Henry Ford, Ford Motor Company, had, had bought a huge insurance policy. And, and it was such a big thing that it ended up in the paper. Uh, and, and a friend of his read that. A longtime friend of his read that, and he was an insurance salesman. And so he went and he set up an appointment with Henry Ford, and he said, Henry, I sell insurance. Why didn't you buy that policy for me? And Henry Ford said, because you never asked. You never asked. We need to ask people to consider Jesus. And in doing so, not force them towards Jesus, but to gently guide them towards Jesus. The friend never asked, even though the relationship bridge was there. Jesus followers, I want you to perk up your ears. You have a dawn soap-like Jesus-sharing power to shine your natural Jesus light into the darkness. And you have the power to do that in a very up-close and personal way. And that can make all the difference in someone's life, leading to an embrace with Jesus. Jesus' power, and you can lead someone to embrace Jesus. But it won't happen until you let the cleansing power of Jesus out. It won't happen unless you move next to somebody, get close to somebody that's in need of the word of Jesus. Until you put your arm around him or her to help guide and direct them, let them know that you care so that you can speak the good news about Jesus into their life. And it's not just words but it's a reflection of what's there in you. I want you to take a moment and see yourself as shining your natural light in Jesus into the world. Where has he placed you? What relationships have already been established there of people who need to hear Jesus? I want you to see yourself building that bridge. The bridge may already be there, but I want you to see that as a means to share the light of Jesus into the darkness. Where is Jesus calling you to build a bridge today? The bridge may already be on its way to being built. It may be really strong already. Or there may be a need, because you see a need in someone around you, whether it's work or home, neighborhood, wherever. You see the need of someone Maybe Jesus is calling you to build a bridge. Not a forceful bridge, not an invasion, but a gentle guiding bridge that brings you there and you can put your arm around somebody. So I want you to think about this. What can you do today to start building that bridge? Who is Jesus calling you to build the bridge for? So you can invite that person to embrace Jesus. And I want us to think about it not just as our own lives. I want us to think about that as a church. A Dawn Soap, Jesus power sharing church. Where Jesus, his cleaning power washes over us and then washes through us and then leads us to be a place where people find and embrace Jesus. It's important for us to be thinking about where God wants us to do that, who he wants us to do that with, and how he's calling us to do it, because he is. May you know and experience the embrace of Jesus and the transformation that comes with that. 
And may you lead others gently to Jesus so they can stand before Jesus and choose to embrace him. Amen. We stand together for our closing song. you ladies that there is some great maple syrup available for you, so grab a, a jar of that on the way out. And to everyone, there's a baby bottle out there for you uh, for the Prices Pregnancy Center. Uh, fill that up with change and bring that back on Father's Day or get it back to us here. But we are so glad that uh, you're here this morning. May you know the joy of an embrace with Jesus, the change that comes from surrendering to Him. And may you May you gently guide others to Jesus 
where they can embrace him and know that life change as well. Amen.